Evander Kane broke into the NHL in 2009 as a first-round draft pick, but not just any first-round pick, but one not afraid to speak his mind on all manner of topics, including diversity or lack of it in hockey. Late last month, following the death of George Floyd, Kane called on his fellow NHLers to stand up against racism and subsequently helped form a hockey diversity alliance. Evander Kane is our guest on this edition of After Hours. Evander Kane is at his home in San Jose. Louis Debras remains at home in Edmonton. Evander, thanks very much for joining us. We are three weeks out from the killing of George Floyd. Uh, demands for uh, racial justice continue as well they should. There's no end in sight to the protests. There's been no end of talk. Are you hopeful this is the beginning of the end of systemic racism? Uh, I hope. I, I think, um, you know, in my lifetime, I haven't seen anything like this in terms of... Uh, the outrage, um, both obviously uh, in hockey and, and in, uh, in society. So for me, uh, I'm hopeful, um, but it's not going to change or it's not going to be the end of it if we, if we just continue to watch and, and, and tweet. All right, let's get to the reaction of your NHL colleagues. Louis. Evander, four days after George Floyd's death, um, you called upon not just NHL players, but athletes for their help. What's your reaction to the number that have stepped forward and spoken up condemning racism? Yeah, I, I think, um, I think, you know, the, the, so the it's been great. Um, I think we've, we've come to, to realize that it's okay to speak up and, and, and speak your mind and condemn something that is um, obviously so prevalent in our society um, and, and also in our game. Um, I think, you know, just understanding um, why, you know, it's important to do it. Uh, I think it's taken some time for, for certain guys uh, or a lot of the guys uh, in general in our league. Um, and being a predominantly white league, I, I understand how it can be uncomfortable to talk about racism, but um, it's necessary. And, and it's something that, you know, we have to take upon ourselves to try to rectify um, in order to make our sport grow because you, you can't have your sport grow um, with the lack of diversity that we have. Evander, last check, your appearance on that program, ESPN's first take had generated over 40,000 views on YouTube, but you could have taken the easy way out and said nothing as most NHL players usually do, but you went in completely the opposite direction, especially when you said it's gonna take someone who doesn't look like me, in other words, star white athletes to, to speak up and, and they did. So you really gave uh, your NHL colleagues something to think about, but did you think you were taking a chance when you did that? Um, I mean, it's never been done before. Um, you know, it's, and, and you know, it's not, it wasn't about calling people out. It was just about, um, or specific people out. It was about calling out everybody. Um, you know, and I used, I know Sidney Crosby and Tom Brady's examples because of their star power and, and, that, and they're white athletes and, and they have big voices. Um, and I think people listen to those voices as well and it's powerful. So um, it's, it's great to see uh, a lot of the players in the league uh, make statements and, and obviously some uh, a little bit more candid than others. But um, we really have to understand that that's just a very small step in where we need to get to. Um, we need real change. We need, we need actual action. Um, we need policies in, in place. Um, and we need accountability uh, from everybody within our league. Uh, because at the end of the day, we're the NHL. We're the, top NH, we're the top hockey league in the world. And if we're doing it, everybody's going to be forced to do it. What you did serve notice this week that you're prepared to take action with uh, something that you did. Louis, follow up on that. Yeah, Evander. This week, you and six other players formed the Hockey Diversity Alliance. Um, What's the mission of the Alliance? Well, the number one mission um, off the top is to eradicate racism in our game. Um, we understand that's a lofty goal. We understand that, you know, that might not be a hundred percent possible. We want to suppress that um, as much as we possibly can and create policies and initiatives that can help combat that. Um, I think it's important that, you know, we, have our own voice, uh, keep our power um, as individuals uh, and as an alliance. At the same time, wanting to you know work hand in hand with the league 
um, because I do believe that there's a there's an opportunity to have a really good marriage there um, and understanding each other's objectives and and helping each other uh, grow our game um, as two separate entities. So you and Akeem Alou are the co-heads of the group, and we should mention the other members are Chris Stewart, Trevor Daly, Wayne Simmons, Joel Ward, and Matt Dumba. Uh, we are told, Evander, that some members of the group actually met with Colin Kaepernick and were well aware that his uh, peaceful protest, taking a knee, uh, cost him his NFL career. Uh, what advice did you get for Ka from Kaepernick? What was his message? Yeah, we, uh, we actually all got to, to be on a call. One of our initial calls, he jumped on. Um, and it was great for us to be able to hear his story, um, especially at the beginning, because, you know, he was taken a massive leap, the leap nobody else has taken in terms of putting himself out there and, and really standing up for what he believed in. Um, and he understood that in our sport, that's kind of what we were doing as well. So there were some similarities. Uh, it was awesome for him to be able to share some of the um, trials and tribulations that went on after he did that. Uh, and kind of giving us some advice with maybe not what not to do, but how we could go thing, how we could go about things differently um, to achieve our to achieve some of the objectives we have uh, in a maybe accelerated fashion. How long were you thinking about forming this alliance? Well, when Akeem's story broke uh, with the Bill Peters thing, um, I believe that was no, late November. We uh, there was actually a large group of uh, minority players in the league that got together, and uh, we had a text group, and we were talking on the phone uh, for quite a few weeks, um, and then that started to kind of phase out a little bit. Um, guys weren't sure, uh, but there were some guys that kind of we continued those conversations throughout the year, and then when Akeem's story again broke with the Players Tribune a couple of weeks ago, and then. You see the Brianna Taylor story and the Maude Aubrey and then the George Floyd. Um, those talks really ramped up and, and we were just, just as, a, as a group, real fed up with everything, not just hockey, but society. And we thought, why not us? Um, the time is now. We have to make a difference as professionals uh, and as minorities in hockey. So we thought it would be a great opportunity for us to, to do something positive and um, make a difference. So, Evander, back to Akeem Alou's story. When we think about uh, how what you said pulled NHL players out of their comfort zone and then uh, Akeem Alou going public with uh, racial slurs from Bill Peters uh, in November, there really, when you, there really is no comparison between the two stories, given that you generated a cavalcade of support and Akeem Alou in November got virtually none from NHL players. Did that both surprise and disappoint you? Um. It didn't surprise me. It was, it disappointed me. Um, I think it didn't surprise me because the fact that Akeem wasn't an active NHL player um, when this story broke. Um, and like you said, race, the race issue and the racism issue in, in our sport is extremely uncomfortable and has been swept under the rug for, for so many years and, and just kind of always pushed aside when it was been brought up. And, you know, I've been, I've been talking about racism issues in hockey for a long time. And, you know, I understand from Akeem's point of view, those issues and those talks and discussions getting pushed aside. So um, didn't surprise me. I reached out to him, obviously, um, you know, kind of wanted to hear the story um, in his own words. And, you know, it was, it was incredible because some of the heat that he took um, from whether it was fans, media, whatever it may be in terms of, Oh, why is he bringing this up now? He's attention hungry. Uh, he's this, he's that. He, he just wants the media attention. You know, this was 10 years ago. He was not an NHL player. That's bull. Like that, that it doesn't matter how long ago it was. Um, and one of the issues I have too, is that people try to denounce the fact that he was an NHL player. They tell you, you know, minor league player, professional player. Well, he played seven games in the NHL. So that would make him a national hockey league player. And, and I think it, it was unfortunate, but it wasn't surprising. And I think it was up to players like myself who are still in the league, who have a platform to, to speak up and, and help spread that message again uh, on his behalf and, and, and really all of our behalves. Evander, what would tell you that things are really changing in hockey? Oh. Um, I know it's, it's early, but just when yeah. you look at this, what would be a sign to you that things are really changing? 
I think um, players, and, and I'll talk about the NHL just because that's the league I'm in. Um, I think players really wanting to educate themselves and learn um, about some of the systemic racism that has gone on in society and how that plays uh, into sports and, and specifically our sport. Um, I think having policies that help uh, create a safe workplace for not only players, but staff in our league. Um, and, you know, there's, there's been a lot of stories, believe it or not, that have come to me um, that people are afraid to speak out and mention because of this whole whistleblower notion and, and you know, fearing those uh, ramifications uh, and the repercussions of, of being that person. Um, but what would really know that what would really, how I really know that things are changing is by not hearing the amount of stories I hear from parents and kids that are playing minor hockey about how many racial incidents they've been involved in on the ice. And that's the biggest thing. And when I stop hearing those stories, then I'll know we've made a difference and real change has taken place. So on that thought, last week on this program, Evander, George LaRock said that um, on the four NHL teams on which he played, he never had a teammate uh, sit down with him and ask him, what was it like for you growing up? What did you have to go through? And recently, Tyler Sagan, who is one of the players who's issued a strong statement, admitted to being ashamed that he's never asked any of his Black teammates how much more difficult uh, their journey may have been. So um, would asking those questions at least be a start in the NHL? Yeah, um, you know, I'll, I'll double down on what George said. You know, I, I can say the same thing. Um, you know, and, and that goes back to sticking to hockey, putting your head down, going to work, and just shutting up and doing your job. And I think, you know, players are uncomfortable. Um, I can understand it how, you know, because you don't have, don't have that experience, you don't have that knowledge, um, it's uncomfortable. And I think that's why I reference educating yourself because the more educated you are on these topics um, and what's really gone on, the more comfortable you'll get, you know, it's like anything, the more you practice, the, the better you get at it, right? So, um, I don't know, I think, like I said, and like we've seen, it's great to be able to have guys come out step out of their comfort zone a little bit, make statements, uh, condemn racism. Now it's another thing to do it in person. It's another thing to, to meet it head on. And, and that's what I'll be looking to see uh, if that truly happens and, and how it happens. You know, I think the narrative needs to stay true. It, it can't be something that's seen as a front. It can't be something that's um, seen as something where we just have it in place. It has to be real. It has to stay true to what we're trying to accomplish. All right, let's bring the discussion to Canada. Louis has the question. Evander, obviously being a Canadian citizen, what is your reaction to the notion, and some people believe this, that there is no systemic racism in Canada? Well, um, <laughs> I'd walk up to any minority if you're a Canadian citizen and just ask them that same question to ask me. You know, you'd probably, be, you get the same answer. That's, that's again, uh, completely incorrect and inaccurate. I think Canada uh, and growing up in Vancouver, it's such a diverse city. Um, there's not a lot of black people. Uh, we have a lot of East Indians. We have a lot of uh, Asian uh, demographic people. And, you know, I have a lot of diverse friends and, and different groups that I hang out with and, and golf with and, and, you know, go to parties with. And, I hear so many different stories from them um, and things that they deal with on a regular basis. You know, I, I grew up in a community that was, or, and I went to high school that was 95% East Indian and hockey's huge in Vancouver. You know, the Canucks are a big deal and guys like to play hockey, but you know, just like myself growing up wanting to play hockey as a minority, you get racist comments made to you all the time. And it was no different from them. And um, I think Canada, uh, kind of needs to take the rose colored glasses off a little bit and, and realize it is a problem in our country as well. Well, your family, Evander, is originally from Nova Scotia and your cousin, uh, Kirk Johnson, boxed for Canada in the Olympics in 1992. He was 37, two and one as a pro and he still lives in Nova Scotia. He's from North Preston. Uh, what do you know about how he has been discriminated against? 
Well, uh, no different from my dad growing up and my uncles growing up in, in Nova Scotia. And I know we, I have a ton of family from North Preston, East Preston. My dad grew up in East Preston. Um, and a lot of people don't understand there's so many black communities out in Nova Scotia. That's where the Underground Railway, pardon me, Railroad went. And that's where a lot of slaves, or slaves um, were set free and got their freedom. So uh, massive black communities out there. Um, I didn't, I was too young to watch my, my cousin fight. Um, I remember watching him fight John Ruiz in Vegas. My parents had the fight. I was in Kelowna with some family and um, but that was the only time I watched him fight. But, you know, speaking to my dad, he played hockey and he was born in 1960. So my dad's 60 years old. The stories that I've heard um, from my dad, somebody needs to sit down and do a documentary because it's, it's incredible the type of racism that he met head on as a black hockey player at that time um, in Canada. And, you know, it went as far as from people threatening his life, people, crowds waiting from outside the parking lots, people throwing things at him on the ice, bottles, glass, uh, players on their teams, um, you know, jumping him, all, all these – I, I don't I don't do it justice by telling these stories. He would, but it was no different for Kirk, you know. And and that was just on the ice. You talk about growing up in a society where you got to walk on the other side of the street if there's a white man walking down uh, the same side same side of the sidewalk you are. You have to cross the street. Schools, uh, you, can't, you can't go to the same school that uh, white people go. To. You have to go to a different school. You can't sit next to them on the bus you got to sit at the back or you got to wait for the next bus all these different types of things hearing this as, as a young kid as five six seven years old uh going into hockey and him my dad trying to educate me on the history and why he's telling me this going to play a sport before i go to play a sport it's it's incredible that that's what it took for me to be as mentally tough as i had to be in order to succeed and not be deterred by the racism that i encountered in 1999 and, and going forward. Well, I mentioned Kirk Johnson because he, by his count, was pulled over by the police in Nova Scotia 28 times in five years. And one of those stops, uh, 1998 in Dartmouth, he was detained for two hours. Um, I think there were, uh, I read there were seven police officers, five police vehicles there. His car was impounded and he was fined $1,000. And eventually a Nova Scotia tribunal um, ruled that he had been discriminated against. When you hear a story like that, does that not blow out of the water the, the notion that there is no systemic racism in Canada? 100%. And what year is that again, Scott? Sorry. 1998. So 1998. So that happened to my dad uh, last year. The exact same thing. He didn't get arrested, but he got pulled over just because he was driving a white Cadillac Escalade, black man, uh, Asked what he was getting pulled over for, didn't give him any, didn't give him any answers, didn't give him any response. And next thing you know, there's five or six, seven cop cars rolling up like he's doing something. Um, and that's in Vancouver in 2019. So that exact same story you just described still happens today. Mm -hmm. It's actually happened to me. <laughs> so, and I'm a NHL player who's from Canada and it's happened to me. So the whole notion that there's no systemic racism in Canada um, is just a crock of junk. Yeah, there's work to do here, just like everywhere else. Uh, Louis, final question. Evander, thank you again for joining us here today. Um, is there anything else that you would like to say? No, I, I just think it's, it's important. It's an important issue, um, you know, that we're embarking on, our group. Uh, and I, and I really hope that this just isn't another footnote on uh, hockey when it comes to furthering this conversation. Um, I don't want this to be pushed away or uh, shoved under the rug again. I think this is a real issue and I love our game. I'm the biggest hockey fan. Um, I, you know, I'm the biggest supporter of our game. And the reason I feel so strongly about this is because we as a society and as a league, we have not even come close to our potential. You know, hockey is the greatest game in the world and there's no reason why it shouldn't be the most popular. 
And the reason I think it's the most popular is because we're not diverse enough. We don't, we don't tick off and off boxes um, with everybody. And I think the more different types of people we get involved in our game, the greater it will grow and it's going to help everybody. So I'll just leave you with that. Vander, again, we want to thank you for your time. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you all for watching on YouTube, Facebook, and sportsnet.ca. Join us every Sunday at 9 a.m. ET. Be safe. See you next time.